Good afternoon. Um, welcome to uh, the last in our series of uh, noon lectures sponsored by the Copernicus Center for Polish Studies at the University of Michigan. This is the last one, as I mentioned, for this, for this semester. My name is Piotr Mikulowski, and I am the acting director of the center for this semester. And it is a great pleasure for me to welcome uh, the speaker for tonight or for this afternoon, Jascha Reinhardt. Born in Poland, educated in England, has been a leading remarkable, has been leading a remarkable life as an art critic, teacher, editor, curator, and gallery director with a particular interest in the intersections of the visual arts and other aspects of human creativity, such as poetry, theater, cybernetics, or robotics. While working as an assistant director at the Institute of Contemporary Arts in London, she curated highly influential exhibitions, including Between Poetry and Painting on Concrete Poetry and Art, and Cybernetic Serendipity, The Computer and the Arts, 20 years after Norbert Wiener's breakthrough book on cybernetics, but also on Japanese experimental art and on toys made by artists. Since then, she has directed the White Chapel Art Gallery has taught at the Architectural Association and directed a Biennale on Art and Technology in Nagoya, Japan. She has published widely on art and technology, on pop art, photography, but also found time to pen a marvelous memoir of her early years, 15 Journeys from Warsaw to London, which has been translated into several languages since its publication in 2012 and to go on to organize even more exhibitions, including Almost Human on Robotics and Art at a space in Gdańsk, Poland in 2015. She is the niece of Franciszka Temerson, and together with her late husband, the art historian and marvelous artist, Nick Wadley, worked many years organizing the Temerson archive in their London home, now in the National Library in Warsaw and culminating with the fresh off the press uh, three volume catalog of the uh, Temerson archive uh, published by MIT Press, the heaviest Amazon package I ever received. Um, <laughs> and uh, so before I, we start the lecture, let me just say a, a couple of things. You will see occasionally a black screen in the in the PowerPoint, and that is intentional. Please do not think that there is anything wrong while uh, uh, Yasha continues to speak. The other thing I would like to say is that there will be quotes from Stefan Temerson, and they will be read by Robert Devcic, a great Temersonian himself. And so I give you a great old family friend, Yasha Reinhardt, who will speak on the Temersons and the art of translation. Please, Yasha. Thank you very much. I shall talk about three types of translation, but first of all, very briefly, an introduction. For those of you unfamiliar with the names Franciszka and Stefan Temerson and their work, this is the first picture of Franciszka and Stefan Temerson that I wanted to show to you. They are together. The year is 1942 and they are in London. And so I will start by showing you some more photographs of each of them because it's easier to think about people and to recall them when you have seen them, when you have an idea what they look like. But we start with Franciszka. She was a painter, filmmaker, illustrator, and stage designer. This is the earliest photograph of her. She, here she is at the age of five in Warsaw. And here, still in Warsaw, she is a student at the Academy of Fine Art, and it's 1924. She is 17. And now 
many years later, during the second year of World War II, she arrives in London as a cartographer with the Polish government in exile. And of course, she doesn't know that she will spend the rest of her life in London. Here she is in her studio in the Maida Vale district of London. It is early 1950s. The painting is dated 1952. And another photo of the same studio, which was on the fourth floor, but now 10 years later. This photograph was taken in her second studio, in a flat the Emersons moved to in 1968, also in May of April. And finally, a happy view of Franciszka at her retrospective exhibition at the White Chapel Art Gallery in London in 19. 70, and now, Stefan, writer, filmmaker, poet, thinker, and publisher. This is the earliest photo that I have found so far. Perhaps Stefan is 18 and the year is 1928. And that is the year when most likely Franciszka and Stefan met for the first time. We know that they marry in 1931. In 1938, they moved to Paris. That's where they want to live. It is the center of the art world. When the war breaks out, Franciszka and Stefan volunteer for the Polish army. And here is Stefan, it's 1939, in his army uniform. Between 1940 and 1942, fate and the war conspired to deposit them in London. First Franciszka, that was in 1940, and then Stefan, two years later, in 19. 42. And now you would see some photographs of Stefan in London. This one is at the Festival Hall book exhibition in 1951, where there was a display of the Temerson's publishing company, Gabbabocus Press. The sheets displayed on the wall are of the second book published by Gabbabocus, Stefan's version of Aesop's fable. Now, Stefan in his study. It's 1977, photographed by the French photographer, Francois Lagarde. Now, look at the window. There were no blinds, no curtains in the flat of the Temesis. Stefan made a composition of adhesive colored tapes stuck onto the glass that prevented people from looking in. And here he is posing in front of his portrait by Francesca. You have noticed that Stefan is nearly always portrayed with his pipe. But here is an exception. He is by the sea in the Netherlands during a time when Eric van Zylen was making a film about him. The film is called Stefan Temerson in Language. It is really a beautiful film. I do hope you will have a chance to see it one day. And 
This is another photograph of Stefan taken in the 1980s. The Denison's achievements during their lifetime are so numerous, so extensive, that it is not possible to encompass them in a short time. And so Nick Wadley made this map about their work. On the left is what Franciszka did by himself. On the right, what Stefan did by himself. At the bottom, what they did together. And at the top, what they did with others. I will also leave this map on the screen at the end of this talk. During the 1930s in Warsaw, in order to make a living, Stefan wrote stories for children's books and Franciszka illustrated them. This is one of their publications about a man building a house for himself, Pantom Budujedo. The first Polish edition came out in 1938. As you see, it's in six volumes, each measuring eight by eight centimeters, and were placed in a box. In the English version, published much later, the title becomes Mr. Rouse Builds His House. There were several books and stories for children. However, the Tamerson's principal activity was the creation of short avant-garde films. Stefan referred to them as photograms in motion. Here is a collage of stills from their first film called Pharmacy, date 1930. The Tennysons made five films in Poland, but only two of them survived the war, as far as we know. One of them was discovered very recently in Berlin. It is called Europa based on the poem of that very title by Anna Tolster. It is the first avant-garde film made in Poland, and the year is 1931-32. But more about Europa later. In England, they make two more short films under the auspices of the Polish Ministry of Information, an anti-war film calling Mr. Smith, which is initially banned by the censor because of this image. And later, another film, The Eye and the Ear, which is an experiment of translating sound into images. When opportunities to continue making films disappear, they found a publishing company. Gabba Bacchus Press, one of the most important small presses in England after the war, which they ran from 1948 to 1979. Gabba Bacchus, by the way, is the Latinization of Jabberwocky from Lewis Carroll's Through the Looking Glass. Gabobocus publishes the first English translation of Ubirua by Alfred Jarry, the first publication of English texts by Kurt Schwitters, the first English translation of exercises in style by Raymond Keno. There are also books by Dietrich Graber and Paul Dieve and 
there is the Black Series, 12 small books by different authors. Writers published by Gabbabacus include Patrick Featherston, Oswald Blakeston, George Buchanan, Bertrand Russell, and of course, the Tennyson's themselves. And by the way, Stefan designed this jacket for his own book, Cardinal Polatour. He particularly liked this image. Best lookers rather than best sellers, said Stefan about the books they want to produce. And indeed, each of the 60 books that emerged from the press during its 30 years in London is not only an imaginative interpretation of the content, but also a brilliant and inventive design. Perhaps one of the reasons for the decision to start the press that year was prompted by an event in 1944. Stefan enters his novel, Professor Ma's lecture for the Hutchinson Prize, which is advertised in the press in 1944. 44. Two years later, a telegram arrives and Stefan is offered a contract. After the contract is signed, the publisher wants to cut the text by 20,000 words. Stefan protests and soon a lawyer is involved. Stefan wins the case and takes back his manuscript, which by now is translated into English. It occurs to me that even though at the time it was an awful blow, without that unfortunate event, the Tamersons may not have felt the need to launch their own publishing company, and Gabbabacus might never have seen the light of day. The book, you see the jacket here, Professor Ma's lecture is finally published in 1953. That is quite a long time after it was written. And of course, it's published by Gabbabacus, but now it has an introduction by Bertrand Ross. Here are the Tamersons again in 1974 on the balcony of their home in Warrington Crescent. And now I come back to the main topic, and we soon learn that translation can be many things. Sound into image, difficult text into a beautiful book, picture into words are all aspects of translation. And much of what the Tamersons do is about translation from one language into another, from one medium into another, and from one meaning into another. And so this is what Stefan Temerson wrote about translation. What is not translatable is parochial, even when the parish happens to be the size of an empire. This applies to history as well to ge geography. What is not translatable from one period to another belongs not to the current of the river, but to the crest of the wave. The universal is translatable, both across the tribal and across temporal barriers. You may reverse this proposition and say, only what is translatable from one 
place to another is human. The rest is a vanity bag containing a small colored mirror, a powder puff, and a number of coins. The first important piece of translation is the Temerson's film, Europa, for which the Temerson's use as their screenplay, the poem of the same type. The poem is by Anna Tolster. And here he is. The poem is published in a book in 1929. And this is what the book looked like. This is actually an image of the facsimile that Gabbabok was published in 1962. The Tennyson start work on their films in 1930. Europa is their second film. The film, Stefan said, is a direct translation of Anatole Stern's words into moving images. This subject is Europe. Europe that eats and devours, that produces machine gun fodder and propels itself through its idiot years of violence towards the murder of civilization. Oh, terrible is the death of Europe, bemoans the poem. But in this race, towards annihilation, there is a moment of awakening. It happens on this page. And here is the enlargement of the relevant section. It is a significant moment in the poem and in the film. A shoot of grass appears between paving stones and we can see it grow and the stones around it begin to shift and crack. In the film, the grass grows into a tree. The tree dominates the screen, leans to one side and falls straight onto the camera. My second example leads to Stefan's translation of Franciszka's drawings into words. But before we come to this translation, I have to tell you about Bayamus. In this novel, the texts make use of the technique of semantic poetry translation that Stefan invented and used in the snow. The technique consists of replacing words that are there with their dictionary definitions. In this way, each word is stripped of all emotional associations. Local color, nuance, and cliche. The individual words become unencumbered by history. Before we proceed with Stefan's translations of Franciszka's drawings, yes, translations of drawings, I just want to give you an example of semantic poetry translation. The example here is the translation of the first four lines of the poem by Lee Pop. The wine among the flowers. Oh, lonely me. Ah, oh, moon aloof and shining. I drink to thee. And now, semantic poetry, translation, line by line. Line one. The fermented grape juice among the reproductive parts of seed plants. Line two, oh, I'm conscious of my state of being isolated from others. Line three, 
Ah, body attendant on the earth revolving about, keeping 238,840 miles, mean aloof and shining by reflecting the light radiated by the sun. Line four. I take into my mouth and swallow the liquid while expressing the hope for thy success. The book by Amos includes several other semantic poetry translations, a Russian ballad, a French song, and a Polish popular song. All these semantic translations and the book of texts to Franciszka's drawings belong to the mid 1940s. Stefan calls this new book semantic diversions. The translation of Franciszka's drawings may involve the same method as the leap of poem, but it is an altogether different proposition because here, instead of translating text to text, Stefan composes, invents text as a parallel to the pictures. The pictures are line drawings made with a biro pen in 1946. That's the year when the ballpoint pen first became cheaply available and Franciszka was always curious to try out a new drawing medium. There are 16 divertisements that make up the book. I will show you just one of them in its various stages towards publication. Here is the original drawing. In this case, Stefan put the sheet of paper with Franciszka's drawing in his typewriter and typed the translation of the image of the sun using the black and red colors of the typewriter ribbon. The typed version reads as follows. One curved and eight radiating black lines represent the heavenly body forming the center of and chief source of light and heat in the solar system. By giving the text about the sun a circular shape, Stefan makes a further reference to this subject matter. It is an early example of what a year later will be dubbed concrete poetry by the German poet Elgen Gomring. A sketch which shows how the text will be placed. This is the second stage. There is no title so far. Stefan types the text on tracing paper, indicating the position of the individual blocks of type and their shape. These are instructions to the printers. Here is the paste stop. There is a title, but still no page number. Now the paste tab will be photographed on black and white film from which a light or plate will be made. The book is printed. With the exception of the cover, it is in black and white. Now we can know what it means to be a stranger. Not known, unfamiliar, not recognizable, not previously seen, heard, experienced, etc. Person capable as well as be of begetting offspring by fructifying those who are capable of being fertilized and bearing fruit, remarkable for his newness and, unex and an unexpectedness, unusual, uncommon, singular, difficult to explain, who makes a temporary sojourn at a place which is other than his habitual place of residence. It's possible that the Temersons might have liked to print the book in color because there are several hand-colored pages, including 
this one. We know a stranger is blue. And now I come to the third type of translation. In 1967, the poet and art critic, Edward Lucy Smith, and here he is, goes to visit Franciszka to discuss their project for a collaboration on the parallel development of a poem and a drawing, whereby each will respond to the other. What actually happens is that Edward sends Franciszka a completed poem, which goes like this. Cockrow, it wakes me. I rise from my dream, how the room changes in the gray dawn light. That shirt on a chair is a man waiting. He wants to tell me about the unknown happenings of day. A draft stirs a sleeve, empty, he vanishes. At Cockrow, the dead go back to their graves. I stir, it wakes me. But the poem is a finished thing, writes Franciszka in response. It has a beginning and an end, stressed by the repetition in the first and last lines. The room has three dimensions, so has the chair and the shirt. The time is made up of the past, dream, the present, it wakes me, and the future, unknown happenings of the dead. The metamorphosis is there before the game begins. That's what she writes to him. I don't know if anything else emerges from this collaboration. What Franciszka has in mind, it seems to me, is something different. A process whereby the words and the lines of the drawing would only touch at some point and let the reality emerge slowly by counterpoint. She looks at the poem again and chooses the words she could, choose, she could change into lines. She picks those words she feels she could do something with. They are, as she says, non-visual. How on there. And here are the drawings she made. Here, the translation exists as not so much part of the process by which the poem is realized, but as a parallel to some elements of the original. And of course, there could be many parallels. What Franciszka is thinking about is probably something rather different, best described as a game of consequences in which the poet and the artist in turn continue to work on the same sequence, one with lines and the other with words, taking over one from the other. When it comes to semantic poetry translation, there are several poets who have used this method to translate songs and poems, nursery rhymes, such as Three Blind Mice and Old King Cole, as well as advertisements, recipes, and other everyday texts. Students in Poland have been given semantic poetry translation as an exercise. But so far, I don't know of any artists and poets engaged in that very 
special game of consequences that Franciszka wanted to initiate. So this is all for now. And here once more is the map of what the Temesims did. I have finished. Thank you, Yasha, for this magnificent uh, presentation and also to Robert for the uh, stentorian voice of uh, uh, Stefan Temerson. Um, before uh, we, we move on to questions um, and, uh, uh, and answers, uh, and you are welcome to uh, write the, uh, if you look at the bottom, you see a QA and a thing on your Zoom, you can write questions uh, for Yasha, please. And let me just mention that, um, on Wednesday, on the 14th of April, also at noon, uh, the uh, Copernicus Center will co-sponsor a Chris Noon lecture, Poland and Hungary, Two Autocratic Attempts to Overthrow Liberal Democracy by Balint Magyar, research fellow from the Central European University. And uh, please, uh, if you feel like it, look into that. Um, so, okay. We will now start the question and answer session. So perhaps, Yesha, if you could, if you could um, stop the share screen now. Ah, there we are. Okay. Um, so please, I, I, I invite the, the, the audience to ask questions. Um, uh, so we do have a question. Um, can you tell us how the Temersons met? And do you have a favorite memory of them? Well, you see, I don't know how the Temersons met, actually, because they met, say, in 1930. So that was, of course, before I was born. And um, I didn't ask them when I lived with them in London how they met. And like many people, one just didn't ask the right questions to the right people. So we don't know. And they didn't offer the information. So how could they have met? Well, what was Stefan doing? He was doing, he was making photographs. He had left the university, first of all, where he studied physics or as an aspect of science that I think was physics. Then he went to another college. He was doing drawing. He was doing uh, a bit of architecture. I'm not absolutely sure what he did. And I think it's photography and invention of the photograph that fascinated him. And I think that for him, perhaps this was the most important thing that he wanted to do as a young man and later. And you know, the strange thing is that we think, or I think that Professor Ma's lecture was his first novel, which he started writing in France during the war, so I would say 41, started it. It wasn't finished till many years later in England. But occasionally he mentioned that there was another novel of which he had forgotten the title and he lost it. So that's one thing that I know. I can't tell you what my uh, favorite memories are of the Temersons, because I suppose there were many. And there were some memories that were not maybe thought of as favorite then, but would be favorite today, because once ideas change, once emotions change, and time passes. Thank you. Um, do you have a question from Spade, actually? 
Uh, thank you very much for this beautiful and fascinating presentation. I would like to know what was the reaction of British intellectual circles, of British artists or critics towards this very beautiful avant-garde and quite uh, European production? Oh dear, no, the Denisons had very hard time in England. They did, they were surrounded by a group, I mean, of admirers, of friends, some of them from different countries and some of them working uh, either as avant-garde poets or experimental poets and writers. But I will tell you a story. Time's literary supplement. In fact, Stefan knew the assistant editor and other writers. Every time he sent something to Time's literary supplement, it was not published. He would send short texts or he would propose a review of a book or he would send a poem. And then one day, he sent a poem which presenting himself as the translator of a poet whose name, whose surname was Wojtyslawski. It was published. And of course, many of his friends recognized Stefan Stark. No, Stefan's, Stefan had hard time in England. They both did, actually. And nobody quite knew what to do with them. Here are people who make films and who write and who paint and who produce books. It's okay today. Today we have artists that work on all fronts. But in the 50s, in the 60s and 70s, that was not the case. And also, you know, there were intellectuals and so nobody quite was quite sure how to take them. And so Stefan had a very special friend, Bertram Russell, who supported him, uh, who believed in him, who was interested in his work. And he was also extremely friendly with Cooch Fitters, who landed in England, also well, in a strange way. And Schwitters was also disregarded in Schwitters in, in England at the time, if you think of it. So, he got his American passport day before he died. So this is, this is the story of people arriving and being different. You know? so, so to slightly go back, there's a question about uh, um, what do you know about Stefan's activities and experiences during the war? Uh, well, no, we do know something. And I edited a book called Unposted Letters, which uh, includes correspondence between Franciszka and Stefan, Franciszka already in, in London, Stefan in France. Of course, at first they didn't even know if the other was alive. So, and they were separated for two years. Stefan landed, well, first of all, he was with the, in the Polish army. And uh, I think that his regiment um, was very poor. There were very few arms that they had. They wore, uh, old boots and old French uniforms. And eventually the, um, the regiment is disbanded. 
And Stefan walks. It takes him six weeks to walk from uh, Brittany to Paris, stopping to earn a living by working on different farms, etc. He stays in Paris for a short time. We know it's dangerous and eventually goes to Vichy, France and ends up in Voiro, Polish hostel for Polish soldiers. And he spends 18 months there. By that time, he knows that Franciszka is alive and she gets in touch with him. I think probably through the Red Cross. I can't remember at the moment exactly. And uh, eventually she is trying to get him to England. So when she gets the permit for him to come to England, the um, exit visa from France is no longer valid. So it's very difficult because you need so many documents to leave France, to go to Portugal, to Lisbon. And in order to go there, you have to have a ticket ready to leave. So many, of, many times this sequence of events fails. But eventually in the summer of 1942, he does arrive in England and then he is sent up to Scotland being a Polish soldier, of course. And he stays there until the Polish government uh, in exile film unit requests his presence to make films. So this is how he is able to come to London and start work on the first film called Calling Mr. Smith, the anti-war film. So that's, um, that's the story. And making films is often working with others and they wanted to work with others. And since they couldn't make any more films, they started the publishing company because again, this was a sort of communal activity. You work with other authors, designers, etc. In fact, they designed all the books themselves in the end. First two books were made on a hand press which was in the corridor of their, um, of their maisonette, it was, was uh, on two floors. It was just outside Franciszka's studio, a very tiny place. That's where they printed the first two books, one about Jankel Adler and the other Aesop. Stefan's version of Aesop's fable. No, it was difficult. It was difficult, but they had good friends. And, you know, perhaps when people make something completely new, which is very different from what people are used to, you know, they must expect not to be accepted immediately. Takes time. It's getting better. <laughs> they are getting better. Well, we have a question that, that uh, dovetails with this is, uh, could you uh, comment on the importance of Gaber Bokus in the history of British publishing through promoting the relationship between art and literature and books? Well, what was uh, what was interesting about Gabberbockers, for instance, I showed you the cover of a book with Kurt Schwitter's 
texts Kurt Schwitters in England. This was the first book um, about Schwitters published in English language, published in England. Now, it, was, it has many different colors. It's printed on different colored papers. And uh, it, I mean, it's absolutely beautiful. And one day, a society which is involved with the English Merds Barn uh, in the Lake District wanted to reissue this book. And so we approach a graphic designer in Holland to see if this could be done. It could be done. It would be very, very, very expensive. Because you see, the Temetson used remnants of various lots of paper that printers had. And that's how it was done. Um, it was, you know, if you wanted to do something, let's see what materials we have lying around. But to repeat that today would be very, very expensive. Well, the value of Tamerson's books, there are values in the sense that it's quite hard to find any that are left, some are left, still at the Harmony in Amsterdam. The Harmonies Publishing Company, of which the Red Director, Jakob Krug, admired Stefan, and took Gabbabokus over in 1979. So there are some books there. There are some books on Amazon, and you can always find some of them. But some of them now are extremely expensive. They become collector's items. But they were published usually in quite large editions. 1,000 copies, I think some in 2000. And so they were published with certain feeling of optimism. And uh, Gabbabokos Press, as press with its 60 publication, has had many exhibitions in England, in Holland, uh, recently, more recently in Belgium, in America, yes, in New York, I can't remember, in the 80s. So, you know, people who are interested in, in experimental literature and experimental presentation, well, maybe now it's no longer experimental, but, uh, you know, can find them. So there we go. On a very different topic, what were the Temerson's political views. Uh, did they ever return to Poland? And if so, what did they think of events there? Well, they certainly received Polish newspapers. They visited Poland. Now, why didn't they return to Poland? After the war, they were asked, why don't you come back to Poland and help us restart, you know, work on films. And Stefan wrote and asked, would we be able to do what we did before the war? And there was no answer. <laughs> I think had they been given the possibility to, you know, here is a film school, please start something. Yes, they must. 
I simply don't know. But by the time I arrived and, you know, they sent me to an English school. So, and by that time, maybe, maybe it was too late. But what did they, um, um, politics, they didn't like politics of any sort. And uh, I think that if Stefan wanted to say to somebody, oh, you are brute, oh, you horrible person, he might have said, oh, you politician, <laughs> you see. <laughs> I mean, there was always a sense of humor. There was tragedy and despair and a sense of humor. And this you can see throughout the books, throughout Franciszka's paintings and Stefan's novels. And if you want to know something really about Stefan, because he didn't like to talk about himself. You know, a few facts here and there. You should read by arms because it's really about him. His way of thinking. I recommend that book. Uh, Anna, uh, uh, to go back to Poland in a sense, you, you mentioned at the outset of your lecture that um, a copy of Europa, a complete copy of Europa had surfaced, I believe, in Germany. Um, yes. Can you tell us something about this? Because that's a, that's a, that's a tremendous uh, piece of news. Yes, yes. It, we couldn't believe it. And I've got a copy on my computer. It's not quite perfect uh, state, but because it's a working copy, but I've got it. Um, it was going to be shown at the Tate on the 17th of April last year. Mm. And of course, we got the virus. Then it was going to be shown in Poland at Zahenta and then Museum of Stuki, and that didn't happen. It was going to be shown at the Pompidou. It didn't happen and then it was also going to be shown in Berlin. It will be shown. I don't know quite yet when or how. We had a showing of it um, for friends of the Tamilsons. I don't remember how many people there were, maybe 50 or something. And that was just a private view. And you see how terrible it is that we have a virus. But something worked out. So let me tell you. Stefan wanted to have music for the film. And of course, the film did have music. But because of COVID and no screenings were possible, uh, there is a composer in Holland who composed other things for Stefan, and he composed music for it, which is wonderful. It is as if it was done as part of the film at the time. And his name is Lodewijk Muns, M-U-N-S. Wonderful. And so, that's one good thing that happened out of all this. So next time when we have a screening, people will see the film with music. Um, and there's a very different question. Um, uh, what, uh, what was the reception of the Tamerson's work in Poland, uh, especially in the early uh, post-war years uh, with socialist realism and so forth, and later on? Could you talk a little bit about that, please? Well, I mean, I don't know that there's much to say. There was great interest. There was always an interest in Tamerson's in Poland. Franciszka 
had an exhibition retrospective at Zahendai in 1963. Um, Stefan's books were published in Poland. Now, Stefan did his own Polish versions. I think there are one or two that were translated maybe by others, but he preferred to do it himself. I think most of Stefan's books are available and were available. Um, and the Museum of Stuki, uh, had a fantastic exhibition um, of theirs, 1981, State of War, and nobody, of course, uh, very few people saw it, and so on. So it was most unfortunate time for an exhibition of that size to happen. Um, but they had another exhibition more recently, Francisca had lots of exhibitions. No, there's, they are very much appreciated in Poland. And, you know, the children's books get reissued all the time. But of course, they were Polish, and some of them have been translated into English, like Mr. Ross. And some of them have been translated into French. And it's, it's very nice the way that the Tamersons treated children. Um, there were no fairies, there were no wizards, there's no magic, there's just ordinary world, which is actually magical. And uh, so, the, they are, they are wonderful books and they will continue. And Pantom Buduya Dom, this is perhaps one of their most famous books. Or, you know, afterwards was published, of course, in Poland in different editions. And it's not so easy to build a house. And it was one interesting thing about that, that the house is being built and it gets a roof and it has a staircase and there are windows and it's painted, etc. And and um, there is water, there's electricity. One thing is missing: the kitchen. It's funny <laughs> that, you know, the Emersons didn't think domestically <laughs> in a way. And you could say that perhaps the kitchen in their flats also was less uh, smaller and uh, less equipped than the printing, the painting, the writing, you know what I mean? So that's, that's how it was. Well, thank you very much after this fantastic lecture and uh, the wonderful um, things that you uh, gave us during the question and answer period. And I want to thank you all again and thank the audience for uh, listening in and uh, learning about the mag magnificent Temersons. And I hope uh, that this is for many who have not encountered them before, a new opening to a magnificent world. Thank you very much. Well, thank you for inviting me. It's my pleasure.